The goal of God is not just to have people agree that he exists. The demons know that he exists mm, and they shudder. Point. Um, what he wants is us to yield our lives to him, to have a relationship with him, to, to surrender to mm. him, to follow him, uh, uh, to be adopted as his son, as his daughter and so forth, have a relationship. That's really the crux. Yeah. And that's where things get hard because people want to come to God on their own terms. You've got this brand new book called, Is God Real? Now, Lee, you wrote The Case for Christ, The Case for Christmas, which I read this last Christmas, and you, you've been making the case for God yeah. for a long, long time. What compelled you to come out with this book, Is God Real? Well, it's so funny. The publisher came to me and they said, our tech people have made a discovery. I said, what? I said, we've discovered that 200 times a second around the clock, Someone on planet Earth is typing into a computer search engine, basically the question, is God real? Mm. And they told me this, and I thought, my goodness, if there's that much interest and curiosity, I ought to do a book and, and, and address that question. So I drew on some of my previous material, added new material, and kind of it's kind of a one-stop shop to kind of get the basic case for God being real. What have you found to be the biggest reasons people struggle yeah. to believe in God? I think there are two. Um, and one is kind of new. Um, the biggest struggle is, in fact, I did a survey. I asked a cross-section of Americans, um, uh, if you could ask God any one question and you knew he would give you an answer right now, what would you ask him? And by a huge margin, the number one question is, if there's a God, if God is real, why is there suffering in the world? It's some permutation of that. That's the mm. number one objection. The number two objection is kind of new. Um, and that is this, if God is real and he loves us and wants a relationship with us, why does he seem so hidden? If I could see him, I believe in him. Right. Well, you know what? Probably not. And I'll tell you why, because we have instances in history where God did make his presence beyond obvious. For instance, uh, guiding the Israelites through the desert. I was just thinking of that. Yep. And even before that in Israel with all of the plagues and parting the Red Sea. They parting the Red Sea. But what happened? Did it, you would think, oh my goodness, God is real. I will, no, they fell into apostasy again. So, so why would it be any different today if all of a sudden God wrote in the sky, hey, folks, I'm really here, we would say, oh, well, that's an optical illusion. Someone's projecting that. Um, so I'm not so sure if God you know, knocked on each one of our doors and said, excuse me, I'm right here. Um, I, I think some people would say, nah, I'm not so sure. Besides which, the goal of God is not just to have people agree that he exists. The demons know that he exists mm, and they shudder. point. Um, what he wants is us to yield our lives to him, to have a relationship with him, to, to surrender to mm. him, to follow him, uh, uh, to be adopted as his son, as his daughter and so forth, have a relationship. That's really the crux. Yeah. And that's where things get hard because people want to come to God on their own terms. You know, I'll come to God if he endorses this and this and this, but if he doesn't, I'm not interested. Um, so they want God to come on their terms as opposed to saying, wait a minute, if God is real, I ought to come to him on his terms. And I used to be an atheist. I, yeah. I tell people that today I am a recovering atheist. <laughs> I, I still have lots of skeptical thoughts and questions yeah. that I have answers to some and others I still am waiting. Sure. Um, but there are also lots of things I believe in. Uh, and I believed in as an atheist that I could not see. Yeah, right. uh, I can't see the wind, but I can see how it affects things yes. like leaves on a tree. Right. I can't see uh, history uh, or, love. I, or love, but I believe in those things because of circumstantial evidence and yes. other corroborating evidences. And so I can't say that the lack of visual sight mm -hmm. demonstrates something cannot exist. Right, right. The question is, why did God choose to do it that way? And, yeah. and maybe there's a reason behind all of this. And, and maybe there's an element of faith that he requires and delights in. And it's a way of keeping proud people out of the kingdom and allowing humble people into the kingdom so that he's not stratifying heaven based off of intelligence and right. IQ or athletic performance yeah. or even visual capability. It's based on maybe a condition of the heart. Right. If God walks a fine line. Uh, he needs to make himself readily evident to those who want to find him. 
And he but, says that he has. And he says that he has. It says in Romans 1, verse 20, it's so clear from nature. Just that like you exists. see on the cover of your book, there it is. The exactly. heavens declare. There you the, go. It's the great big cosmic shout in your yes, face yes. that God is here. Right. But on the other hand, he has to keep himself sufficiently hidden so that those who don't want to find him won't find him. That respects our freedom of will. Mm. That respects our ability to decide whether we're going to follow him or not. So God kind of walks that line. I remember being on the movie set of uh, the movie Left Behind that I did, and there was one of the actors there who said that he just cannot believe in God. And when I asked him that question, why he would say such a thing, particularly an actor on the the set of a movie about God, God, he said, because I prayed when my sister got leukemia, that God would heal her, and he didn't. And I just can't believe that there would ever be a God. We have to relate to that. We have to understand yeah. that is a traumatic yeah, thing. Yeah, that's let's, a real thing. Let's deal with that. Let's talk about that. That trauma is real. But at the same time, Christianity does offer good answers in that area. Yeah. And, and we need to get to that at some point. Lee, uh, your book covers so much. Uh, w- one, of the, one of the groups of people I'm thinking of are those who do have a belief in God. They, yeah. they know that God is real, yeah. but their belief in the reality of God or his character has been shaken to the core because of tragedy. I can think of people I know who have experienced a tragedy that is so grieving, that is so extreme, I don't even want to explain it to you right now. And they've got to be having these huge monumental questions about who is this God that I have believed in? What is he really like if yeah. he allows these kinds of things to happen? What does the book offer to someone like that? Yeah. You know, you look at other religions, look at Eastern religions, and they say that trauma like that or suffering is maya, which means an illusion. It's not real. I want to say baloney. Jesus was honest. Jesus said at one point, in this world, you will have trouble. But then he says, but take courage because I have overcome the world. Mm. So in other words, by his Um, uh, resurrection from the dead, he has established that he is who we claim to be, the unique son of God. And when we're going through the kind of tragedies that many of us go through in this world, he is the one we need to turn to. Why would we not turn to him for comfort, for answers, for uh, the next step to take in life and so forth? I mean, he's saying, take courage. I've overcome the world. In other words, I'm here for you. Um, But I think there's also intellectual reasons to understand why they're suffering in the world. You know, God has existed from eternity past as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in a perfect love relationship. And when God decided to create humankind, he said love is the greatest value in the universe. So I want humans to experience love. Well, the only way we can do that is if we have free will, because love always requires a choice. You know, when my daughter was little, they used to have a toy called Chatty Cathy. It was a doll. Remember Chatty Cathy? And you pull a string on the back and let go and the doll would talk to you. So she had this doll and she'd pull the string and let go and the doll would say, I love you. It was how good it was. Uh, Did that doll love my daughter? No, it was a machine. It had to say that. It had no choice. That's not love. Real love involves a choice. And so God gave us free will, but what have we done with it? We've walked away from God. Mm. We've hurt each other. I mean, I could take my hand and I could feed a hungry person, or I could take that same hand and pick up a gun and kill an innocent person. But it's a little disingenuous to pick up a gun and kill an innocent person and then say, God, why do you allow suffering in the world? Mm. We're the problem. Mm. We've opened the door to sin permeating the planet and, and oh. the evil that has resulted. This is so, this is so good. Um, someone once reminded me that God is not the author of evil and suffering, but he is the author of a story that has allowed evil yes. and suffering. That's right. We've it. actualized it. The poten- he had to give us free will for, in order for us to love. But the, the result of that could be and has been that we would open the door to sin, that we would be self-centered, that we would hurt each other and so forth. And that's what's happened. But there was no other solution to um, uh, having a world of love um, uh, unless the free will was given. Lee, in your, in your book, you share a few examples uh, of, of lines of study that demonstrate the existence of God. Yes. One of them is the cosmos with William Lane Craig. Yes. Uh, unpack that for us. This is an argument for the existence of God that if I were still an atheist, This one line of evidence would convince me that God exists. Um, And here's what it is. 
Virtually every uh, scientist in the world now believes the universe began at some point in the past. Um, um, in fact, that the, the universe is not eternal. It's not eternal. It has not always existed. Um, Alexander Vilenkin, the head of the Cosmology Institute at Tufts University, said um, the proof is now in place that the universe had a beginning. Well, that makes a strong argument for God because whatever begins to exist has a cause. We now know the universe began to exist. Therefore, there must be a cause behind the universe. Well, then you ask the question, what kind of a cause can bring a universe into existence? It must be transcendent because it existed apart from the creation. It must be timeless or eternal because it existed before physical time came into being. It must be immaterial or spirit because it existed before the physical world was created. It must be powerful given the immensity of the creation event. It must be smart given the precision of the creation event. Um, it must be caring because he created such a wonderful habitat for us to exist in. Mm -hmm. it must be personal because he had to make the decision to create. And then the scientific principle of Occam's razor tells us there would be just one creator. Well, wait a second. Transcendent, spirit, e um, um, eternal, smart, powerful, powerful, smart, loving, unique. That's a description of the God of the Bible. And I'm telling you, Kirk, if I were still an atheist, I would look at that argument and say, I do not think. And I've, I've listened to atheists and skeptics try to attack that argument. I don't think there's a good counter argument. I think that argument does it all. And I personally, anyway, would come to the conclusion there is a divine creator. One of the other lines of argument that you talk about in your book is uh, the argument of DNA. And I yes. think years ago, I had asked you, what's, what's an argument that you just find so compelling? Yeah. And you said DNA. And I think yeah. you described it. Uh, you know, I live here in California yeah. and on the beach, uh, you can find ripples in the sand yeah. created by the water, right. patterns that, that could happen yes. by seemingly random right. movement of the water. But if you looked into that, Sand, you told me, yeah. and I saw John loves Sally forever with a big heart around it. Yeah. You'd say, now, that's different because right. that contains information. Exactly. That's not pattern, random movement of the elements. That is communicating a message. Yeah. And that's exactly what DNA is. Exactly. Unpack that for us. Yeah, you have 100 trillion cells in your body. If you were to open any one cell and uncoil the DNA, it would be six feet tall. Embedded in that DNA is a six letter or a four letter chemical alphabet that spells out the precise assembly instructions for every protein out of which you're made. So in other words, just as English uses a 26 letter alphabet to spell out words, DNA uses a four letter chemical alphabet to spell out the assembly instructions for all that you're made of. Uh, that is information. And whenever we see information, whether it's a computer code, whether it's a painting on a cave wall, whether it's a newspaper article, always, always, always there's an intelligence behind it. And so I think that is a powerful argument for God. There is more information in every cell in your body than you would find in 200 years of the Sunday New York Times. It's, it's just a, a mountain of, where does information come from? That's there, right. There's no example anywhere. And in my book, I look at the, the, the kind of uh, theories that scientists come up to to try to account for it. They can't. They can't. There, there is no example anywhere of, of in, uh, information that does not come from an intelligence. And this is a new argument. This is, I know you know Stephen Meyer, um, PhD from Cambridge University. He has popularized this argument, and written books about it. He's, he's awesome. Um, uh, so this is new stuff. This is only the last 40 or 50 years. In your book, you also document uh, story after story of people who have come to faith in God and the transformation of those people yeah. are themselves evidence of a supernatural power. Can yeah. you share one of those stories? Oh, I'll, I'll share my favorite one with you. Um, and this is right. There are some people have a direct experience with God and um, uh, it's just hard to explain it away. But my favorite one is, is a guy that you probably have heard of, um, Evil Knievel. Uh, Evil Knievel was a drunk. He was a womanizer. He was a gambler. Um, and and he, crazy. And crazy. He, he, he jumped over huge things with his motorcycle. He was in the Guinness Book of World Records for the most broken bones of any human being. So, so, But he's on the beach in Florida late in his life, and God spoke to him. He said, I felt it on my inside. And the voice said, Robert, which is his real name, Robert, I've saved you more times than you'll ever know. Now you need to come to me through my son, Jesus. And he's blown, he doesn't even know what to do. 
And he, he said, who's Jesus? So he calls Frank Gifford, the sportscaster, yep. Kathy Lee Gifford's husband, and says, Frank, I had this experience. Who's Jesus? And Frank said, get that book by Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ. That'll kind of explain everything. Anyway, Evil Knievel ends up having a radical encounter with God, radical born again experience. Mm. He is turned 180 degrees. When he is baptized, uh, he tells his story with such passion and such clarity that 700 people got up and came up and received Christ, were baptized on the spot. Wow. And when he died a couple of years later, at his request on his tombstone, it says, believe in Jesus Christ. Mm. Um, there's a life. That is so cool. 180 degrees. He called me up. I, I had never met him. And he called me to thank me for writing my book. And, and I answered the phone. And I said, this is Lee. And he says, this is Lee Strobel. I said, yeah. So this is evil. And I thought, Satan has got my phone number. Is that even possible? <laughs> no, no, evil can even, oh, okay. So we became friends. And, uh, and I'll tell you what, Kirk, his biggest regret toward the end of his life is if I'd only come to faith earlier, if I'd only come to faith as a teenager, I could have lived my life differently. I could have lived my life, could have lived my life for God. And, and he, he lamented that over and over again it was his biggest regret. And so I tell a lot of young people that story. Because at the end of his life, he said, you know what, I, that's my, if I could go back, it would change everything.